안녕하십니까 정재혁 교수입니다. 어, 한 25분 어, 내지 30분 정도 대담하고 10분 남짓의 시간 동안 어, 질문을 받도록 하겠습니다. 여기 진행 요원들에게 질문을 주시면 나중에 받아서 예, 주 교수께 전달을 하도록 하겠습니다. 어, 영어로 어, 대담을 하도록 하겠습니다. Uh, I think your presentation uh, is sweeping and also covering both micro and macro dimensions of China's rise. Um, if I say I agree much of what you said, uh, they will kill the expectation of Ambassador Park that uh, this is going to be a very intense debate-like session. So I, I will have to pose some questions. Sure. Um, you said you would present a global perspective on China's rise. But global perspective is uh, uh, highly divided. As I see it, there are uh, three different groups. Uh, pessimists who would say China's rise will never materialize because it will never suffice to replace the United States in the end. There are also agnostics. They say, you know, it's uncertain. So many, so many uncertainties. So, you know, it is difficult to predict the outcome of China's rise. There, there are also optimists. But optimists can be divided into two subgroups. Uh, one, uh, they, they think China's rise is a possibility, but that is going to pose a significant danger uh, to the world. The other group of uh, uh, optimists say China's rise would never pose a danger or risk to the world order. It will actually be conducive to a new order in the formation. So as I, as I listen to your presentation, you tend to belong to a group of optimists as well as a non-alarmist. Uh, is that a, a fair yeah, characterization? Fair, fair, fair. Okay, yeah. if that is the case, then let me uh, state my question. Because uh, optimists like you uh, tend to have four characteristics. First one, they tend to believe a historical return that you just showed is a, uh, 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 effect. Uh, they they take, take it for granted. But I, I wonder whether everyone would believe the United States is going to be another United Kingdom. So how would you respond to that? Uh, no, no, no. I have three other okay, sub-questions. Sure, sure. Optimists would also uh, love to use PPPs. But if you, if you ask economists, not all economists would agree with the utility of PPPs. So how would you respond to that? Sure. Third, uh, you mentioned about China speed. Uh, of course, China speed has been uh, amazing, uh, 3.9 times uh, that of the United States. But then again, if you focus too much on speed, that also produces sloppiness in terms of quality. That also creates a lot of uh, backlashes. So how does that fare into uh, China's rise? And then finally, uh, in more recent years, particularly in the United States, not only the Republicans, but also Democrats tend to uh, talk about, we've got China wrong, okay? But somehow, I don't see any of that in your presentation. So how would you respond to these four characteristics of the so-called optimists on China's rise? Um, Thank you so much for uh, this very, very um, cogent and astute, you know, question. I would do my best, do my best to uh, try to answer that uh, in a very succinct way. Uh, I certainly agree with you that uh, uh, history may be one, just one of the benchmark, um, uh, but uh, you know, we should not take uh, the historical pattern for granted. Okay, uh, nothing guaranteed that, uh, obviously, obviously. Uh, but I think the, the, the real message is that uh, China is probably the only living ancient civilization um, that uh, have, uh, uh, you know, have pretty much evolved over more than uh, 3,000 years, okay, and cope with all kinds of ecological uh, technological and other kind of uh, uh, challenge uh, within itself and also from the outside. Uh, uh, and uh, it has ability uh, to assimilate the new element into its own civilization. Um, uh, like, you know, incorporate Buddhism, you know, it's, it's into uh, its uh, belief system. 
uh, and also in uh, recent time, uh, I think we all like that, you know, Taiwan, Korea at the same time, you know, we, uh, we assimilate uh, so many uh, ideas and know-how and institutional arrangement from, uh, from the West. Okay, but then uh, we, we are not really transform ourselves, you know, entirely into another Western society, right? You know, you still have your uh, certain continuity in terms of your identity, uh, your own uh, legacy, and then you can, uh, you know, on the basis you can transform yourself into a modern uh, society. You pass down a trajectory of modernization, not entirely comparable to what the Western society have traveled down historically. Okay, so actually you have this multiple passes to modernity. Uh, and trying to simply exemplify another possibility, you know, o o over the last uh, 40 years. Um, um, I, I would say the resilience uh, of their society, and even its political system, okay, um, uh, will probably, you know, uh, throw the dice, okay, uh, uh, in trying to favor in terms of you know, how it tries to cope with all the new challenges, you know, environmentally, uh, uh, geostrategically, uh, but also how to handle uh, the new t uh, technology frontier. Uh, uh, believe it or not, you know, China will be probably become the first society will uh, make transition uh, to uh, have all the uh, financial tra transaction uh, uh, doing it digitally. It's quite conceivable. It might do that. It probably will be. Uh, uh, move faster, much faster than many other societies, including South Korean uh, society, uh, to adopt uh, to adopt uh, the driverless car, you know, as a major means of transportation. You know, you, you, so so it, it's it, China. I think nowadays, uh, you know, they 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 have uh, many different possibilities. Try to harness uh, the possibility brought about. By, uh, uh, by all the uh, uh, phenomenal uh, exp uh, explosion of those new possibilities. Uh, uh, in particular, you know, I, I will call people's attention to uh, the Xiong'an, uh, the new development in Xiong'an. Okay, it, it will be a, a, a smart city, it will be carbon-free city, it will be all driverless uh, transportation city, the first of its kind in the world, okay. Um, so if you look at, you know, this side of China, you will say, well, you better be serious about, you know, its future. If you, obviously, you know, if you, especially you go to places like Hangzhou and Shenzhen, okay, um, uh, the innovation, the pace, pace of innovation, uh, I would say, you know, I, I would uh, definitely not try to underestimate its potential. Now, about... Uh, U.S. No, I don't believe that United States will become not U.K. No, because United States is, uh, does, uh, has not really built up its uh, uh, its uh, leadership based on uh, colonization, right? Okay, and U.S. I would say still will be a very very formidable, and innovative, and militarily you know probably stronger uh, player than China uh, for many uh, years to come. But nevertheless, China. Uh, I would say, in terms of absolute sight, you know, uh, uh, and, and also on, on many other score, my uh, my outpace, you know. So this, uh, but but I would say this competition uh, or this race, okay, will, will linger on for quite a while, okay. So I, I don't think UK it would be the fate. Uh, I mean, the British Empire, right? Because they 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 uh, they are uh, founded on, on very different kind of foundation. Um, uh, so I think China also expects that. They, they, they don't expect that the you know, United States will own a long-term decline. They don't believe so. Uh, they, they simply, you know, would like to, hopefully, you know, to figure out a way how to, uh, on one hand, uh, avoid, you know, a, 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 a full-scale conflict with China and to figure out how they, the two can live peacefully uh, you know, together and, 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 and also in a limited way uh, to work together to solve all other uh, problems that the human society is facing uh, right now. So that's, I think that's uh, the Chinese assumption as well. Um, uh, speaking of the purchasing power parity, uh, GDP statistic, yeah, I know all those debates. Okay, actually, uh, I would say uh, the nominal GDP and the PPP, they serve uh, different analytical purpose. They, 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 
you know, they, they are apt at you know, answering different questions. Uh, for financial world, obviously nominal GDP uh, is more meaningful, right? Uh, you're talking about you know, uh, you know, whether, how much money you have to invest in Wall Street, how many much money you have to invest, I mean, how much US dollar you have, right, to invest in US treasury. Uh, then you need the real money <laughs> de denominated in dollars, right? However, if you're talking about, say, military budget, I would say the PPP is definitely more meaningful, uh, uh, Im important than nominal. Uh, you know, it's so costly for the United States to build one aircraft carrier. It's so costly for the United States to simply produce one next generation uh, fighter jet, right? Uh, the cost is way down uh, in China, okay? So you, w when you compare the military budget, I, I mean, you will, you, you, you will be kidding yourself if, if we compare them on nominal term without taking into consideration of the purchasing power, okay? So I, I, I think, you know, the, so I think it depends on what kind of uh, issue you're going to address, you know, that, so you probably have to use them uh, when they are most appropriate. Now, uh, about the uh, China speed, I, I think China um, uh, probably uh, most economists that, you know, I, uh, n n not those so-called, those uh, uh, foreign policy elite, okay, they, they engage in all, all kind of debate, okay, uh, but if you look at, you know, the, the, uh, the report uh, produced by, say, uh, McKinsey, Okay, report produced by the World Bank, uh, uh, report produced by the World Economic Forum. Okay, uh, I think there are actually consensus that it's fully conceivable that China can sustain, you know, this uh, six point uh, percent growth rate, or maybe down to five point five uh, for quite a while. Uh, uh, but remember, uh, China's per capita GDP. Uh, is only, uh, you know, the one-fifth of the United States, okay? And remember, when South Korean GDP uh, at that point, you know, is one-fifth of the United States, you still have very specific growth rate. And that applies to uh, Taiwan as well. You know, when you are only, you know, on per capita basis, you are only one-fifth. So, which means that, you know, there are still uh, ample space for you to improve yourself, improve your productivity, uh, to make you know more uh, better use of technology, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, and I think the most uh, uh, you know important thing to remember that China is now every year, uh, you know they are producing uh, almost uh, 10 million, uh, close to uh, 10 million college graduate, and many of them they are trained as engineer and scientists. Okay, well the quality may not be as great. Okay but they are catching up. Uh, and, and this is a society where you have this uh, system of uh, uh, cross-fertilization and diffusion. The best practice uh, uh, will be, you know, widely adopted by, you know, if, uh, if, you know it, it was, if it's inventing Shenzhen, it will be adopted across Guangdong. It was adopted by Guangdong, it will be adopted by all the neighboring province. So this diffusion uh, is such a, uh, you know, huge economy. Uh, and already, I think, it already uh, pretty much, I would say, uh, developed not a, a, a fully fledged uh, basic research apparatus, but it, it, it's coming very close to that, uh, which means that uh, China uh, will be able to compete in all the uh, cutting edge uh, technology of the 21st century. Uh, you know, I, I don't think they will uh, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, the precluded from any of those core technology that we identify. You know, like, uh, G, uh, you know, uh, bio, uh, you know, medical technology uh, and quantum communication, uh, AI, uh, big data, you know, you, 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 you just name it. Um, so I think uh, for, for that reason, I would say uh, although uh, I recognize, you know, the readily that there are huge uh, disparity and diversity, right, across China, okay? If you compare Shanghai with, with uh, Gansu, 
uh, Gansu is like uh, the third world, and Shanghai obviously belongs to the first world, right? Uh, but, but, but for China, and also for continental uh, size economy like China, on the, on the other hand, it's very natural. It's very natural, okay? It's so vast, it's so big, it's so diverse. Uh, and I think China has doing, uh, as the government has doing its, uh, its uh, uh, best try to uh, try to, you know, try to transfer more resources uh, to the hinterland, to the uh, periphery of, of the territory, and also in particular try to provide the same level of public service, the same level of infrastructure uh, to, the, uh, to the backwater of the country. I'll give you just one example, okay? If you go to the United States, if you go to a small city, if you go to a rural town, you cannot have 4G communication anymore. Okay, you are stuck with 3G or even 2G, unfortunately. Okay, but nowadays, 1.2 billion people in China, they get access to 4G. Uh, and in many provinces, the 4G coverage is 100% uh, for all the village. Okay, so, so that, you know, that's also uh, you might call it a socialist legacy, you know. So, so in, in, in any case, uh, I happen to be belong to the uh, optimist camp, although this might not be politically correct in Taiwan. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so, but I, we have to be cool-headed. We have to be, you know, down to the earth, okay? okay. Not to be holding to our wish, uh, yeah. I only have 10 minutes for our, our discussion because I want to have 10 minutes for floor discussion as well. Um, my second question concerns globalization. You mentioned a lot about globalization, but one thing that struck me was that China is going to be the leader of the hyper-globalization. I didn't quite catch the logic of that because uh, in, in the early 1990s when I just got out of the graduate school with a PhD, the catchy phrases back then were the death of nation states, demise of national borders, mm -hmm. natural economic territories, globalization, internationalization, all that. And a quarter century later today, all those are almost dead. Now everybody talks about national interests. Everybody talks about, you know, make America great again, China dream. I don't know about Korea dream, but you know, all these nation states based uh, 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 drives, how, how do they go along with the globalization drive that will be led by China and that is going to be hyper in nature? I, I, I don't quite catch the logic of that. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Oh, yeah, of course, I, 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 I would be uh, glad to clarify that. Well, first of all, um, China for the last 35 years, uh, China is not in the driver's seat, no. United States is in the driver's seat, okay, setting the rules, okay, and to remove all the man-made obstacle, right, to make this, uh, uh, this, uh, this planet, uh, uh, this world flat, right, in, in sure, okay. Um, but China is a booster, okay, it amplifies the impact of what we call the hybrid Global, hyper globalization. Okay, so this is my point number one. My point number two is that I say you know, China will become, uh, for the future, okay, it will become uh, not just, not only uh, a booster anymore. China will co drive this globalization process. China will revise some of the rules uh, and, and probably cultivate a different path uh, for the globalization 2.0 if I can use that expression. Uh, in globalization 2.0, you have to strike the balance among three competing goals. Okay, whether it should be friendly to capital or friendly to environment and friendly to people or to labor, okay? Um, so I would say uh, nowadays more and more, uh, you know, uh, country, they realize that uh, globalization, you know, if, if you don't have any uh, parallel arrangement uh, uh, to harness, okay, its uh, economic power, 
then you will definitely end up with a very lovely, lopsided distribution of wealth and income. Okay, so you, you need all kinds of uh, supporting arrangement, domestically and reg region-wide and globally, uh, to say you no know, to harness uh, the uh, monopoly power of those uh, those uh, technology giants like Facebook, you know, uh, Amazon, things like that. You should create a new space for individual, for uh, micro company, for small medium-sized company. Okay, so when I say China try to induce, introduce this new global convention, new infrastructure for e-commerce, it will make inclusive growth more, uh, more uh, a viable option, rather than you know, uh, what we have, are witnessing over the last 35 years. Okay, the top 1%, the top 10%, you know, rip all the benefit, uh, and then download all the risk to the remaining 90%. China is the only economy, you know, the, uh, that its labor wage, pretty much for the last 35 years, have gone up uh, in parallel with its productivity, in parallel with its economic growth rate. Okay, this is phenomenal. But in most other society, this is not the case. Okay, this is not the case. Okay. Uh, so that's why China, you know, they will introduce many new models for economic cooperation. They will give a uh, uh, state, uh, intergovernmental agency, uh, a bigger role. Uh, something opposed by the new liberal. <laughs> something opposed by the, you know, uh, in the past, in the World Bank, you know, the uh, IMF. They, they simply say, you know, you, you know, you have to respect so-called market forces. Okay, don't do too much. Okay, I would say the global public good has been, uh, been undersupplied for a long, long time. And China have a new agenda. They think that we have to expand the scope of the supply of global public goods, okay, including you know, the funding, the long-term lending for the infrastructure project. That's why they, you know, the AIB you know, is for, okay? And that's why China is so popular in Africa. But, you know, but, so this is what I call you know, China uh, for the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, will become a co-driver uh, and, and will modify, you know, many of the rules which have been designed from the very beginning, I would say, to uh, simply give those trans transnational capital and people with transportable skill, you know, a, a, a free space to, to roam around uh, and which become not politically sustainable. You have all kind of backlash, right? Uh, uprising of those, you know, you know uh, leftist, uh, ultra rightist uh, political forces, you know, so uh, it's time to, to make some change. Yeah. My final question uh, is about your own perspective. Uh, you refer to a lot of notables like Alison, you know, Kinderberger, Nai, and so on and so forth, but you are, you're also from Taiwan. So instead of giving us a, a global perspective, why don't you give us a Taiwanese perspective? I can only speak for myself, okay? And you know, Taiwan is a divided. Uh, yeah, yeah, a Taiwanese perspective. Taiwan is very divided, just as much as South Korean society is, you know, uh, over the question of inter Korea relationship. So, Taiwan is also divided uh, over the issue of cross trade relations, obviously. Uh, I, I have been a long time advocate, although I belong to a minority, that we have to, we have no other choice for Taiwan other than constructively constructively engage with China, with mainland China. Uh, China uh, posed some challenge, but also some opportunity to Taiwan, okay? So you should minimize the challenge, uh, but same time, you know, to maximize uh, the opportunity. But also I think Taiwan can play a very important role. You know, we shouldn't, uh, I also told my student and my colleague, you know, we should not underestimate ourselves, you know? I, I'm not talking about, you know, whether we are uh, you know, a very, very uh, world-class producer of semiconductor. That's hardware. I'm talking about soft power. I think Taiwan can uh, uh, actually uh, provide Chinese, uh, uh, especially middle-class intellectual, okay, and the reform-minded past maker, you know, uh, that uh, many useful lessons. Uh, you know, how we evolve from a one-party Right, uh, all the ten regime, uh, how we transplant uh, a more inclusive, 
a responsive political system onto a culturally Chinese soil. Okay, um, and, and how to you know the put uh, uh, people's uh, you know the, uh, on the first priority. You know when you design your policy, when you consider how to allocate your budget, how to uh, reform you know your system of public service. I think. Uh, Taiwanese, uh, although you know, we are now in a very tense relationship between the two authorities, but believe it or not, you know, a uh, scholar from Taiwan, NGO worker from Taiwan, the many, you know, the savvy uh, political commentator, they have wide audience in China, throughout China. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, in a very subtle way and oftentimes unnoticed that China, Taiwan has exerted so much influence on Chinese modernization. Give you just one example. Uh, a legal scholar uh, from Taiwan, he's expert on uh, all kind of uh, civic, uh, civic law, you know, civic code, okay? From bankruptcy uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to security uh, regulation. His textbook, you know, for almost 20 years is a must read for all the law college professor and graduate students in China. Uh, and he have, well, mostly uh, without his uh, authorization, <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but his textbook is so, you know, uh, widely read, you know. Uh, li literally, he incubate a whole generation of scholars, you know, who, who try to figure out how to make transition from so socialist uh, uh, legal system to a system that you know is more conducive to market economy, I just you know just, yeah, just use that, that one example to to say you know we should be, on one hand, more self-confident about you know the the tail can wag the dog if you do it right. Uh, now uh, I have uh, gone through the uh, questions that I got from the audience, and then I selected three. So I'll, I'll now read them out. Uh, one is in English, the other uh, two in Korean, so I have to translate that. But anyway, you reply to these questions as you see fit, OK? okay. First one, uh, some of the Western observers argue that Chinese development of fifth generation uh, IT technology would lead to the situation where Communist Party controls its people like the Big Brother in George Orwell's 1984. And what is your view? In fact, you mentioned about Xiong'an. Right. You know, smart city has both light and dark size. So uh, hope you can elaborate on this. Second question, um, the share of China in, in world economy is growing and it will become much, much bigger in the future. But nevertheless, aren't we forgetting about India? That's second question. Uh, the, uh, the third question is, do you think uh, China's miracle today is because the Communist Party uh, took the power in 1949? What if the Kuomintang took power in 1949? What would have been different? <laughs> Good question. Uh, although a hypothetical question. Let me uh, uh, talk about the, f the first one. Uh, uh, I have uh, gave quite a few talks about um, this um, AI revolution. You know what's the implication for for uh, human society. Um, I think, ready or not, I think we uh, enter into a new age, a new era. Okay, this era, uh, the f one of the feature uh, is it will be hyper transparent. Uh, whether you like it or you don't like it, it doesn't matter. It's coming, okay? Um, so Apple company follow you everywhere, okay? It monitor your uh, movement, physical movement, you know, from your house to your work to, uh, to the shopping mall. Uh, you follow your, your behavior, okay? Facebook have, is doing the same, okay? And obviously, uh, 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 you know, the t uh, Tencent, that's the, you know, the equivalent of uh, uh, in the Facebook, uh, you know, in, in the WeChat. And the big brother, obviously, obviously, they can open the back door, okay, of all those big data. And 
uh, uh, and so does uh, American National Security Agency. Okay, so if you use Huawei, uh, you are eventually you are potentially you know you you are monitored by Chinese security apparatus. But if you use Apple, unfortunately, potentially you are monitored by American authority, one or another. Okay, and for the future, I think every footprint, okay, from your birth, okay, will be recorded, will be, you know, will, will, will be registered, and, and, and then uh, those records cannot be erased, okay, it's coming, okay, I don't think, uh, 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 you know, nowadays, yes, China is more advanced in terms of, like, you know, facial, facial recognition, right, the Chinese public se uh, security, uh, you know, they can, uh, uh, you know, on a camera, they, 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 they zero in your, 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 your face, then in three seconds, in three seconds, okay, uh, uh, using their AI and, and also the big data, okay, uh, uh, with 90% uh, of uh, success rate, okay, they can identify your identity right away, okay. But I think this will proliferate everywhere, no matter, you know, how many le legislation EU is going to enact, no matter you know, what US Congress is going to do. Uh, I know that sounds, you know, I'm very uh, kind of ideologue in terms of you know, how uh, technology might transfer, transform society. I think the most sensible way of facing this challenge is how to harness, okay, those new possibilities, okay, and how to create a new counterbalancing uh, arrangement, okay? So to make sure that people have the final say, have the final power to control those data, to control, uh, you know, those surveillance, you know, they will be held accountable to some kind of other uh, competing authority, okay? I think that's, that's the only way to go, okay? So I think uh, in China, I, I do think that uh, in the future, it's not going to be like uh, just you know, one direction evolution. Uh, by the time Chinese government becomes so, uh, you know, evasive, uh, so uh, powerful, so ubiqu ubiquitous, I would say there they will be voices, there will be, you know, social forces, okay, uh, or even within the Communist Party itself, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, ask for some kind of uh, offsetting. Uh, uh, and, and but, but remember that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the hyper-transparent society um, is something we don't get used to. Uh, but our next generation probably will, uh, will probably uh, easier for them to live with that. Okay, which means that you don't have really privacy. Okay, uh, if you use digital money, for, for, for example, right, every transaction will be recorded, okay, and cannot be erased. Uh, so there will be no more corrupt official, right? You cannot hide your money, okay, uh, underneath your mattress. No way, okay? Uh, so so uh, I think it's a matter of how... So I think that the, the competition is that which society will, you know, be more flexible, innovative, you know, how to incorporate, okay, those new possibilities into... Uh, they are long, you know, the achieving the goal of long-term sus sus uh, sus sustainable uh, social development. I, I think that that's a real challenge. Okay, uh, forget about the, the old dichotomy, you know, totalitarian versus you know liberal. Uh, I think that that's obsolete. Okay, we enter into a new age. Uh, I think every society, including South Korea, have to, you know, to think very carefully, seriously, but also to be very, I would say, proactively and, and innovatively. You know, not try to hold on to something which is not going to, uh, to last. Okay, secondly, uh, India. Yeah, no, I never discount India. Actually, I don't have time to go through all my uh, slides. Okay, uh, I believe that India will definitely become, you know, say in 20 years, the second large economy. Okay, United States, unfortunately, will become the third, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and Korean, you know, based on Price, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper, you know, long-term projection, Korean uh, will uh, slightly decline from its uh, 11 or 12, uh, you know, large economy position to the 17. Okay, uh, we, you know, we, I think they are so-called emerging seven. 
China, uh, India, uh, uh, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, Turkey, uh, Mexico, um, um, uh, uh, Russia. Okay, um, uh, I think that uh, so that's why you know I think the core of the world economy will be reconfigured in a very, very uh, uh, in a very fundamental way. Uh, G7 will no longer be the most important forum anymore. Okay, already you know it's overtaken by G20, right? Uh, and within the G20, there will be two complete competing blocks. Okay, G7 on one hand, and the the BRICS on the other. Okay, and BRICS more like an advocate for the entire developing country emerging economy. And the G G7 right now, right now is in disarray uh, due to Donald Trump. Otherwise, U.S. can be a very effective leader. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, align with EU, you know, based on the cross-Atlantic solidarity. I hope the next U.S. president after Donald Trump might be, uh, you know, the actually refurbished. Uh, uh, so, so then we have, you know, the two block, you know, pretty much on parity. They have to come to uh, 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 consensus on all the major issues affecting uh, the world economy through consultation. There's no other way, you know, uh, to achieve that. Uh, about the, uh, whether the nationalists uh, can achieve a even, <laughs> I would say, uh, I would say yes. Uh, it's, it's definitely, you know, for the first uh, 35 years, right? You know, the, I don't think national would introduce the, uh, the uh, disastrous, you know, cultural revolution. Uh, will not uh, push through all those very radical socialist, you know, uh, reform. Uh, I, I think for a lot of uh, countries like China, like India, uh, many other non-Western society, once, you know, there's no more civil war, no more foreign aggression, they become truly independent, uh, they can maintain stability, peace at home, and start building up the society, you know, education, infrastructure. And they can catch up. They can learn. They can close up the gap. Okay, but you know, the, uh, I think their IQ just as great as Caucasian. You know, why not? They cannot. Uh, you know, the uh, you know uh, learning. Uh, you know, try to become also you know uh, as you know productive as innovative. You know, as advanced uh, uh, Western society have uh, e e exemplified. So definitely, I would say China on the national would do. I don't know whether it will, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, do a much much better job. But I always definitely think that it would do a remarkable job. Uh, remember, Japan got very anxious uh, and to accelerate their aggression into China because when the eyewitness, when Chiang Kai-shek, you know, unified more than half of China, not the entire, but more than half of China, uh, and set up this uh, Nanjing regime, right? Then it created a so-called Nanjing Golden Nanjing Decade. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, productivity, in terms of industrialization, you know, it was stunning at that time. And the Japanese really were frightened. If I allow, you know, this to go on, <laughs> you know, uh, China will eventually expel me out of China, out of North North East. Uh, uh, so, so that's why uh, the the. Uh, you know, uh, those warmonger, you know, they, they push through a much more aggressive, uh, uh, you know, a strategy against the, the nation, against China. Yeah. Well, with that interesting counterfactual note, uh, this session is closed. Please uh, join me giving Professor Zhu Yinhan a big round of applause.